2D games use 2D sprites. Actually, um, uh, some 2D games use projections of 3D models or use vector art, which cannot um, uh, technically be considered a Shut up, I'll teach you best. <laughs> As I've been learning more about Godot's 2D engine, I've come to realize how versatile the program really is. Through working more on projects, development has become less about struggling to get over the first hill of implementation, and more about optimizing my development process. Sprite work is a definite part of that optimization, but it's easily one of my weakest fields when it comes to game development. So today, let's ignore that part entirely. A game made of a single sprite. I can't say any existing examples come to mind when I think of that. Like my previous challenge, the single model video, this idea is a really dumb and arbitrary limitation on making a game, and there's a reason people do not do it. But I'm gonna take it a step further today. Last time, the single model was more of an artistic limitation rather than a mechanical one, even though everything was based off of the single model. Today we will be doing none of that. Once the sprite enters the game, there will be no other sprites imported. Like last time, I'm using sort of a rule set for myself. Rule 1 is the aforementioned one sprite limitation. I can only draw and import a single image file to the game. Absolutely no exceptions. Rule 2. Last time I put an 8 hour limit on the game's development to simulate a shift at the job I didn't have. Well, now that I do have a job, the 8 hour limitation is there because I don't have a lot of free time to spare anymore. The third and final rule is similar to the last videos, but more targeted this time. Rule 3 is that I cannot make a simple 2D platformer. I don't think I would learn anything new or interesting by taking the easy route, so I'm going to make a 2D side-scrolling game with a little more nuance to its jumps and movement. That being said, my idea for this game is much less firm than the model's initial idea. Actually, real quick before I do start, the demo for my Metroidvania game, Crookspire, is now live on Steam. Heavily inspired by the Castlevania series, you play as a frog who uses his tongue as a whip to traverse a giant castle. You collect some really sick upgrades along the way, and the sh movement is great. If you want to support the channel or like this genre of games, go ahead and check it out. Link will be in the description. Anyways, the sprite. Since I'm not a cheater, we need to start with a sprite before laying down any movement groundwork. Starting with a sprite like this is usually not a good idea, since you should block out the game's concept and movement before doing any artwork. But since I had experience from last video on what to expect with my limitations, I had a decent idea of what to do going into this. I'm going to employ the same idea from last video where I have a two color base with two different shapes layered on top of each other. But, to make things a little more interesting this time, I'm going to make a black border on the shapes, which may allow for some more tricks and tinkering. And there it is. That's the sprite I will be using. It looks pretty boring and similar to the model's approach, but the things we'll be doing with it are completely unique from the model. Alright, before anything, I'm actually going to set up a real quick tile set with the sprite. This is one of the things I did kind of miss. I'm calling my sprite folder Sprite, because there's only one. With that out of the way, let's talk about tile sets. Tile sets are a simple concept, where an entire sprite is treated as a sheet of smaller sprites to place around a level. There are a lot of reasons why this is massively preferable to placing individual sprites, but the main one is definitely scalability. See, instead of having a bunch of tiny objects that represent parts of the terrain, tile maps make sprite placement almost like a brush where you can paint the level. It has the added benefit of allowing tiles to store their own collision. Using tile maps, we can take our sprite and separate it into smaller chunks to paint the level with. Already, you can see why this is extremely helpful. Using this method, we can form terrain and background out of the one sprite and give parts of it collision that match. Because of the shape of the sprite, I end up editing a bit to match this method a little better. This method also sparks the initial idea of what the game should be in my mind. 
Enough about that. Collision is pointless without a player. So let's do that next. With a small spark of inspiration, I started editing my character movement to be more acceleration based. My idea for this game was a speed game where you would build up momentum on slopes to rocket through the level. So, the uh, idea for this game is coming together. My current momentum system wasn't enough to cut it though, so I spent a good chunk of time reworking how my acceleration works so that it functions better on slopes, and so that the floor normals of opposing slopes gave a detriment to your speed. Like... Ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho! Oh no, I'm not touching the controller. <laughs> I also added a slam move, where gravity was briefly intensified to make you slam down to the ground faster, in order to reach a slope. Ooh. Clean. Dude, I keep trying to dash like I'm playing Crow Expire. Actual brain rot. Pretty soon, I realized that sliding off the slope randomly is really easy to do. So, I tried cobbling together my own solution to the problem. After a lot of trouble, I realized that Godot had a built-in solution for this. Its character body 2D class, which is the basis of the player character's node, has a method to run physics called move and slide. What I didn't know was that there was a floor snapping property I could alter to make the player stick to the floor easier. I made the snapping distance egregiously large when the player was doing the slam attack, so that they wouldn't slide off the slope they were grinding down. And that fixed the sliding issues. Now, sliding and jumping off slopes felt good. It's time to tackle the next facet of this project. That being... Terrain Generation. I've been always meaning to tackle this at some point, but for this project I didn't have time to get into complex terrain generation, such as ones using noise input. That being said, those are more inclined for usage in 3D, sandbox, or top-down games. I definitely did not need something like this for the side-scroller. Instead, after a long time spent theory crafting, I boiled down the necessity of what I needed in a random terrain algorithm. I would need a continual line to procedurally generate slopes, bumps, and flat terrain using the tiles in my tile set. I need this line to continue seamlessly between generations, and I also need it to not generate impossible terrain to get past. Therefore, I would make a simple function that chooses a generation rule to place in the tile map as the player moves horizontally. Each time the player is close enough to the edge to generate more terrain, the function has a chance to generate a specific chunk of terrain. In those chunks, a random length is also chosen to be generated, which should allow for decently varied terrain. To start out with, I only implemented flat terrain and downward slopes to test how sliding feels across these large distances. It actually turned out quite well, much to my surprise. Let's add code that fills in the ground underneath with tiles too. And we've got ourselves a random generation. Granted, it's incredibly basic and doesn't allow for much unique terrain, but it'll do for this short prototype. Since terrain could be loaded in, I wanted to implement unloading terrain that gets far from the player, but uh, it did not work out. I was experiencing no lag by not unloading the terrain, but when I did, yikes. So. I decided to press on after wasting time on this and not really being able to fix the lag issues. Oh, also I added a camera zoom depending on your velocity and how high you jump. It was about time I made our player a bit more interesting. I wanted the player to look similar to how he did in the one model video, so I decided to go for a more humanoid shape again. That being said, making the character natively in Godot was a bit difficult. I had to manually create limbs with node parenting, and not to mention how animation would go. Since anti-aliasing is a thing on sprites more so than models, the components of the character looked quite blurry and cheap. <laughs> oh my 
god, this looks so dumb. <laughs> um, this poor guy. Poor thing. And for the model stuff, the anti-aliasing was non-existent because it was 3D, but this is just so sad. Overall, I am not so happy with how this guy turned out. Thusly, he will be named Stupid Dumb Idiot Baby, S-Dib for short. Now that S-Dib is sliding around, another issue is very clearly apparent. You can barely see his ugly mug when the camera's zooming out and in like this. To address this, I wanted to try two things. First, I wanted to set up a mini viewport to zoom in on him in the corner. Kind of like a Pizza Tower-esque motion TV. This proved to be very tricky, with confusing documentation on the viewport. It was especially difficult to get it working with not being able to see what it rendered in the editor. But, I was eventually able to finagle it with an odd kind of system thing. I used a camera to render to the viewport, then took the viewport output and copied it to a text direct on the HUD that would display it. Now, we have an actual vision on Estib. The second thing I wanted to try to increase visibility was having the background change color as you jump. Using a shader, I was able to accomplish that by adjusting the blue value depending on height. Now that those are taken care of, there was a bit more tweaking to do. This is gonna be so scuffed. No, dude, I just had a thought enter my mind and I can't unthink it. Ah, uh, no, dude, I'm thinking of that gif. The Bowser gif, dude, I can't unsee it. Why? Now I can't, now I can only think of it, the fact that it's probably animated just like that. Why? <laughs> Actually, I have something better that I'm thinking of now. I'm thinking of Drawn to Life now. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot nicer than the previous thought. Okay, alright. I went back and forth, but ultimately, I decided to add counteractive slopes to mix things up a bit. So back to the terrain generation, I added bumps and upward slopes to avoid. There's still one small problem. The game has no objective. With the way everything was set up, I decided to go with the simplest solution. I added a score meter and a multiplier that get incremented based on consecutive jumps in airtime, with a time limit of 60 seconds to see how high of a score you can reach. But wait. I hear you saying. Those numbers are a new sprite. No. Oh. <laughs> you poor innocent little fool. You have no idea. These numbers use a shader to color little slices of the sprite black. They are the sprite. My, but, but, but what about the background? <laughs> it too is a recolor of the sprite. The border around the zoomed in view? Chunks of the sprite. Every little line and detail on the player? That's right. All parts of the sprite. And the score pickups that boost your multiplier that you can find on the slopes? Well, those those ones are those ones are a little obvious, but uh, it's it's the sprite too. The whole game, all of it, it's all from the sprite. The whole game from one stupid shape. And here it is, the version of the game I had when I hit the time limit. I have to say, sliding down the slopes is decently fun, and getting bigger scores with the multiplier system is neat. A few parts of the sprite limitation actually did have neat effects, like the numbers seemingly bouncing as they tally up from the score. Overall though, yeah, this game probably would have been better without the sprite limitation. Same conclusion as the one model game. 
That's pretty obvious, though. That being said, I am once again glad to have done this, since it pushed me to learn a few new things I hadn't yet, like simple terrain generation and viewport rendering. It turned out pretty nice, all things considered. Thank you for watching, and before you go, I have one more thing to mention. The game might not stop here just yet. I am going to be starting a short series where I add the best comment suggestion each video to this project. Whether that be a simple change like adding a second sprite, or a massive change like flipping the genre of the game entirely, well, uh, that'll be up to you. I'll be posting an initial shorts video alongside this one, so go check that out. But that's all for now. Until then.